Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will not accept a situation in which there are restrictions on subject choices in senior secondary school. That's what the then Education Secretary, Fiona Hislop, said when Curriculum for Excellence was launched. Has the government kept that promise? First Minister. Well, we want uh, pupils in our schools uh, to have the widest choice uh, possible. Uh, that is uh, why we are encouraging schools to be uh, flexible in their timetabling, to look at options to give uh, students uh, choices beyond their own school. Uh, there are a number of very good examples uh, right now of how that is being done. Uh, and I don't know whether Ruth Davis is specifically talking uh, about advanced hires, for example, uh, but, for example, we see the number of young people leaving our schools with an advanced hire actually increasing. Uh, and amongst uh, young people from our most deprived communities, the number is actually increased by 40 per cent since 2011. Uh, so we'll continue to work hard uh, with local authorities and with schools uh, to ensure that our young people have the broadest and widest choice possible. Ruth Davison. President Officer, I'm slightly surprised at the answer because subject choice is narrowing. A new survey has made it clear that restrictions are indeed happening right across Scotland right now. The majority of schools now only offer six subjects in S4. But while the survey is new, it only confirms concerns that have been raised by MSPs across this chamber since the SNP took charge. And the consequence is severely limited options for young people when it comes to choosing their hires, especially for those hoping to study multiple sciences or languages. So we've got a broken promise, we've got less choice for young people, and parents still in the dark as to what's going on. What does the First Minister say to them? First Minister. I think Ruth Davidson, when we look at exam passes in our schools, the evidence doesn't bear out her argument. Now, uh, I think she is referring, when she talks about a study, to uh, the work of Dr Jim Scott. I have no criticism whatsoever of Dr Scott's work. But it looks solely at pupils in S4. The senior phase in our schools, of course, is designed as three years long. It goes from S4 to S6, because what matters are the qualifications that pupils leave school with, not just the subjects they study in S4. And when we look at the results uh, when people leave school, what we find, uh, contrary to what Ruth Davidson is saying, is the picture is steadily improving. Dr Scott looked at the picture since 2013. Since then, the number of, the number of higher passes has increased. They don't want to hear this. The number of higher passes has increased by 4% in Scotland and as I said uh, already the number of advanced uh, hire the, the number of pupils leaving school with advanced hires is increasing as well so we've got more young people coming out of our education system with more exam passes I would have thought that is something Ruth Davidson should welcome yeah. Ruth Davidson I'm talking about school choice first minister it's well seen John Swinney's not sitting next to you today but don't just take it from me, here's Keir Bloomer, one of the architects of Curriculum for Excellence. He warned about this five years ago. It will severely limit the options for those who want to study three sciences or several languages. So how bad do things have to get before the SNP government will own up to its own mistakes? Because we've got teacher numbers down, we've got literacy standards slipping, we've got numeracy stagnating, and subject choices are falling for our pupils. And as always, it is the poorest parts of Scotland that suffer the most. If you go to a school in one of the wealthiest parts of Scotland, you've got a 70% chance of being able to choose between 12 or more advanced hires. Can I ask the First Minister, what's the figure for the poorest neighbourhoods? First Minister. Well, I'll, I have to provide uh, that figure. I don't have it in front of me, but I can tell Ruth Davidson, and I would have thought this is what matters in terms of the number of our poorest pupils getting advanced hires. The number has risen by 40% from those from our most deprived communities. And that, that is six times as much as the rise in our least deprived communities. In our least deprived communities, the increase was 6.8%. In our most deprived communities, the increase was 40%. And actually, the qualifications that young people come out of our schools with is what really matters. The number's going up for advanced hires. 
The numbers are going up for hires. As I said a moment ago, the number of hire passes has increased by 4% since 2013. Last year, hire passes exceeded 150,000 for the third year in a row, despite a fall in the size of the school year group involved. And when you look at tariff scores overall, which look at qualification results generally, not just hires, we see tariff scores also increasing since 2013 across all attainment groups. So whether we're talking about deprived communities or not deprived communities, we've got more young people coming out of our schools with better exam passes. That is what is important, and I would have thought people would have welcomed it. Ruth Davidson. So basically, the First Minister doesn't know. Well, let me tell her. The figure is two. There are just two schools in the poorest parts of Scotland where you can choose between 12 or more advanced hires and in the rest you get nowhere near that. That's the reality in SNP Scotland. She wants to talk about Professor Jim Scott. Let's hear what he has to say. The S1 to S3 curriculum is in significant disarray. Pupils are then crashing down suddenly to as few as six subjects in S4, meaning that they're effectively picking their hires at the age of 14. And it's pupils in the poorest areas that are being hit hardest. There is a scandal going on in secondary schools right now. And this government is curtailing the choice of our young people to pursue that same broad-based education that the First Minister enjoyed, that I enjoyed, that generations of Scots have benefited from. And it can't continue. We support a parliamentary inquiry into this issue. Will the First Minister back it? Yeah. First Minister. Well, well, there has been a scandal in Scottish politics this week and it involved the resignation of one of Ruth Davidson's front benchers just yesterday. But moving back... Moving back to education... All right. Thank you. Let's have some order. Let's have some order. First Minister, please. I think I've hit a raw nerve, uh, <laughs> presiding officer. Back to schools and education. And let's just get back to the facts. Ruth Davidson talks. Ruth Davidson. I, I don't think the Conservatives actually want to hear the answers here, <laughs> presiding officer. And I wonder why. Let's get back to subject choice. I'm not sure if Ruth Davidson is aware of things like the Advanced Higher Hub at Glasgow Caledonian University, the Virtual School Network in Highland Council, the initiative in the Western Isles. What are these things? These are about how schools are looking at different ways of timetabling and partnership approaches with nearby schools and other partners to extend choices for their pupils. But I cannot believe, presiding officer, that Ruth Davidson doesn't think that what is important here are the hires and other qualifications that our young people are leaving school with. So let me recap for the benefit of the Tories who don't want to listen to this. There are more young people, including in our most deprived communities, now leaving school with qualifications, including hires. There are more young people leaving school with advanced hires. In case you didn't hear it the last time, 40% increase in our most deprived communities in the young people coming out of our schools with advanced hires. More young people with more qualifications. That's a sign of the success of our education system, which is why the Tories don't want to recognise it. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Thank you, presiding officer. Up and down the country, every year, thousands of children and young people are referred to our National Health Service for mental health treatment. And every year, thousands are turned away. Yet this government does not know the reasons why. As far back as March 2017, after months of pressure, the government finally promised an audit of these rejected referrals. Well, it's been over a year, and this audit report is nowhere to be seen. Do you think that's acceptable, First Minister? First Minister. Well, the, audit is, the audit is underway. There was always uh, work that had to be done in order to complete the audit. So <laughs> the audit of rejected referrals is well underway. Sam H are conducting interviews and focus groups with young people and their families as well as speaking directly to referrers such as GPs and teachers. So that audit, that important audit, 
is underway, it is progressing well, and I understand it's due to be published by the 30th of June. Richard Leonard. <clears throat> but in the... Well, I, I, I look forward to the publication of this report, but the trouble is this. In the time between the announcement of this review and now, there have been a further 5,410 rejected referrals. Over 500 in Tayside, over 1,000 in Lothian, and over 1,500 in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. That represents thousands of Scotland's most vulnerable children who have been let down. Presiding officer, this is Mental Health Awareness Week, but for these young people, this has been a wasted year, time they cannot get back. Many of us believe that mental health must be given the same priority as physical health. But if thousands of children were being referred and rejected for surgery, would it really have taken you over a year to find out why? First Minister. Firstly, as I think everybody understands, there will be a range of reasons for referrals being rejected, but it's exactly because we want to understand better uh, what those reasons are, where those reasons are perhaps understandable and where they are not and unacceptable. That will then enable us to see what improvements are needed so that we can route young people to the most appropriate help and support. Now, when you undertake to do an audit, you have to then painstakingly do the work to complete that audit and inform any further work uh, that has to be done. Uh, so as I said, that audit is underway. I hope Richard Leonard uh, will welcome that. It is going well. Sam H is leading the work around interviews and focus groups with young people uh, and uh, their families. And as I said earlier on, also speaking to the people who refer young people, uh, GPs and teachers, for example. So that work is underway. I think that will be important work and it will then allow us to base the improvements that are required uh, to be done. So I would hope Richard Leonard, having raised this, and uh, I think he's right to raise it, will welcome the progress that is being made. Richard Leonard. But there was a six month delay before the audit started. And the simple fact is that mental health services for children in Scotland are struggling. Labour has raised this issue with your government week after week. So have the Liberal Democrats. We have proposed a review of rejected referrals and we're still waiting. We proposed access to a counsellor for every school. You did not listen. We explained that cuts to councils would hit services for young people, but you cut them anyway. Children as young as five are being referred by one part of Scotland's health service to another and then rejected. First Minister, you once said that you had a sacred responsibility to make sure every young person gets the same chance to succeed. Where on earth is that sacred responsibility to these children? First Minister. Be before I leave the issue of the audit of rejected referrals, we announced an audit. We had to plan how that audit uh, was going to happen so that we get it right. The work is now underway and I've given the progress report on that. It's important that we get that work right in order that the action that flows from it uh, are the right actions. More generally on mental health and also on children and adolescent mental health services. Funding for mental health services is increasing. Uh, in 2017-18, the budget for mental health exceeded a billion t uh, pounds for the first time. The workforce is increasing. Uh, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service workforce is up by 65% uh, since uh, 2007. The number of psychologists has more uh, than doubled. Uh, we're also investing in additional mental health workers in key settings like accident and emergency, GP surgeries, uh, prisons. There is work underway in schools, an important issue that Richard Leonard uh, had raised. Some schools already uh, provide access to school-based services. In other areas, schools utilise the skills of their pastoral care staff liaising with the local educational psychological service for specialist support. Every school has a named contact in specialist uh, CAMS uh, that can provide ongoing support. And of course, as part of our mental health strategy, uh, we've already started a national review of personal and social education, which includes counselling 
In schools, we also continue to support Childline with funding to provide confidential advice and information to children, young people and their families. So there's a whole programme of work underway to address the very issues that Richard Leonard is talking about. It's important that we continue to discuss these things, but I don't think it's asking too much for Richard Leonard to at least know what's already happening before he raises these questions at First Minister's question time. Thank you. We've got three constituency supplementaries. The first from Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, CalMax Managing Director told the BBC that ferry services were facing their worst disruption in seven years and the island communities were not always getting the service they expect. I would call that an understatement. Uh, the busy summer season hasn't yet started, but we're already seeing reductions to services, postponed summer timetables, and major vessels are offline for lengthy periods of time. Does the First Minister accept the islanders are sick and tired of this constant disruption and how confident is she in her transport minister's handling of this catalogue of failures? First Minister. Well, these are important issues uh, that the Transport uh, Minister engages uh, with on a, a regular and ongoing basis. We're investing heavily in ferry services, including in uh, new ferries. New ferries being built uh, right now, of course, at Ferguson's uh, shipyard. Any disruption to services or reduction in service to any community um, is deeply regretted and should be avoided uh, in all possible circumstances. But sometimes ferries, of course, need uh, maintenance work to be done. But we'll continue to work closely with CalMAC to make sure uh, that our island communities get the ferry services they deserve. Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, does the First Minister agree with me in welcoming the news uh, this morning that the stake in the fixed oil betting terminals will be reduced from £100 per spin to £2 per spin? And does she commend all campaigners, including Stop the Fob Tees, Campaign for Fairer Gambling and Gamblers Anonymous, for their perseverance and determination? And will the First Minister acknowledge this welcome decision is one that will actually help people's lives? First Minister. Yes, I very much welcome the UK Government's decision to reduce the maximum stake uh, to £2 and I would commend all of those who have campaigned for such a move, uh, including Stuart McMillan, who uh, has long taken an interest and campaigned on this issue. Uh, the Scottish Government encourages any actions that can help to reduce the harmful impact of problem gambling. Um, and as Stuart McMillan has said, Scottish stakeholders and many politicians have long pushed for robust action to be taken. Uh, so I commend all of them uh, for that. Of course, we will study the detailed proposals uh, with interest and continue to call for appropriate action to tackle this problem even more effectively. Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, presiding officer. First Minister, I was contacted by a constituent at the end of April who, having submitted a bowel screening test, was contacted and advised to secure a follow-up appointment. When she contacted them, she was told she could not get a defin definite appointment at that point. She is still waiting and is understandably highly anxious. I wrote directly to the Cabinet Secretary and following a further follow-up earlier this week was advised that we will not get a response to this issue till about the 12th of June. I understand this problem is affecting a, sig a significant number of people. Could the First Minister investigate this as a matter of urgency in order, that, in order that those who are affected can be reassured that whatever the cause of the problem, appointments will be set, um, secured as soon as possible? First Minister. I, I know there is uh, work being done by Greater Glasgow Health Board to address this issue. Obviously, I, I don't have all of the details of Joanne Lamont's constituency case. I will undertake today to investigate this, to look into it, and the Health Secretary will respond to Joanne Lamont as quickly as possible. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2016, the last Scottish Parliament election, the First Minister stood on a manifesto which promised we will invest £3 billion to build at least 50,000 affordable homes over the next five years. Does that commitment stand? First Minister. Yes. Patrick Harvey. I'm very pleased to hear it because that's not what we heard from the Housing Minister when he spoke to the, the Parliamentary Committee uh, asking questions about this this week. The, the change of language from building 50,000 to delivering 50,000 might sound abstract, but it's measured in bricks and mortar because here we are almost approaching the halfway point of that five-year term and more than a third of what's been done so far is not actually about building new homes. Refurbishing empty homes is a good thing. Bringing former council houses back into social rent is a good thing. Those are good ideas, but they don't increase overall housing supply. We need to build new if we're going to achieve that. So will the First Minister 
and in particular the modern standards of disability accessibility that need to be built into modern homes will be done best by building new. So will the First Minister have words with our Housing Minister, make sure that he recommits to that 50,000 target of new build homes, uh, and is that not the only way of ensuring increasing the overall supply of housing in the way that's needed? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, our commitment is well known and hasn't changed, uh, and we are determined to deliver on that commitment. Uh, I would take well, firstly, I agree with the importance of new build housing uh, as part of any uh, investment in housing. So I agree with Patrick Harvey uh, on that general point. I, I would slightly take issue with him on the broader point that there is no other way of increasing the supply of housing. I could point to areas in my own constituency where the refurbishment of existing housing is actually, actually bringing houses back into productive uh, use. So I would slightly take issue uh, with, with Patrick Harvey on that front. But the investment that we... Uh, are putting into this is significant. Patrick Harvey mentioned the three billion figure in his opening question. That's a 76% increase on our previous uh, five-year investment. It includes 35,000 uh, for social rent, which is important. There is 756 million, more than that, in fact, I understand, available this year to fund uh, this uh, ambition, and much of that has already been allocated to council areas uh, across uh, the country. So this is an important commitment from the Scottish Government, and one that we are absolutely determined to deliver, and to deliver in full. Yeah. Question number four, Willie Rennie. A new Freedom of Information request has found that adult mental health waiting times are getting worse. 1,000 adults waited over a year to get access to mental health treatment. That's more people waiting for longer. Will the First Minister accept that access to mental health services is getting worse in this country? First Minister. Uh, well, as I said in response to an earlier question, we're seeing increased funding in mental health services. That's important and I hope will be welcome. We're seeing a growing workforce to deliver uh, mental health services and we're also uh, trying to rebalance care uh, away from uh, often hospital and GP care uh, more into community settings uh, where people would benefit from preventative uh, mental health services. Uh, all of that work is encapsulated in our uh, mental health strategy backed by additional funding. In terms of the issue about adult weights, uh, adult weights uh, are not yet where we want them to be and the Mental Health Minister is working closely with local health boards to improve the situation and it's important that that work continues. But just uh, for context, the, the average uh, weight uh, in Scotland uh, amongst territorial boards is seven weeks. It ranges from four to 17 uh, weeks uh, and that's uh, published data. Uh, so that gives some context, but of course we continue to work with health uh, boards to improve that situation uh, and uh, consider that, that to be extremely important work. I don't, think, I don't think the First Minister understands. The number of people waiting over a year has doubled since the day that she appointed her dedicated mental health minister. Since Christmas, I have challenged the First Minister about specialist perinatal mental health services. In half of Scotland, there are none. I have challenged about waiting times for children. They are longer. And I have challenged her about her suicide prevention plan. The wait for that goes on and on. The First Minister tells us that the service that people receive is getting better but the evidence says that she is just plain wrong. People with poor mental health deserve an answer. Why are mental health services getting worse in this country? First Minister. Well, a number of issues uh, raised there. Uh, Willie Rennie is right to say people uh, want answers, so let me give him uh, specific answers. Uh, if I go, go through briefly the particular issues he raised. Firstly, in terms of waiting times, we want to bring waiting times down. Uh, and particularly we want to bring the longest waiting times down. But I said uh, previously in relation to adult waits, the average wait is seven weeks for uh, child and adolescent mental health services. The average wait there is uh, 10 weeks, uh, with 11 out of 14 health boards having an average wait of between five to 12 weeks within the 18 week target. Uh, so that's the context, although we continue to work hard to improve that uh, even uh, further. In terms of uh, perinatal mental health, uh, an issue uh, that Willie Rennie has raised before, and I know the Liberal Democrats have uh, issued uh, some suggestions there today, which are very uh, welcome. As I said the last time, we have established and are funding the perinatal managed clinical network. 
uh, the clinical network brings together specialists in perinatal mental health, nursing maternity and infant mental health and is working to improve the recognition and treatment of perinatal uh, mental health care. Um, and lastly, in terms of the suicide prevention strategy, uh, many people, including Willie Rennie uh, across this chamber, asked us to do more work between the draft strategy and the final strategy. Uh, that is underway. The final strategy will be published, I understand, before the summer recess. But perhaps uh, this quote from uh, the Samaritans uh, help again to give some context. The Samaritans, who had raised some concerns about the draft strategy, uh, said recently that they are encouraged by the commitments made by uh, myself and by the Minister for Mental Health that the final strategy will cover more of the recommendations for change from the pre-engagement report that was shaped by those with experience of suicide. So all of the, similar to my replies from Richard Leonard, I absolutely recognise the importance of mental health. We are, of course, in Mental Health Awareness uh, Week. There are more people coming forward for mental health services and treatment. That's something we should continue to encourage because it shows the stigma from mental health continues to reduce. Our responsibility is to expand the capacity of services and that is what we're working to do across the whole range of issues that have been raised today, both by Richard Leonard and by Willie Rennie, and we will continue to do exactly that. Thank you. We've got some further supplementaries. The first from June McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, journalist STV walked out in response to the announcement of 59 job losses, including 34 in news. Does the FM agree with me, the First Minister, apologies, agree with me, that this is no way for a public service broadcaster to behave, particularly as STV made a profit of 18 million last year? And does she share concerns that these cuts are part of a plan to prepare the channel for sale to ITV, which would be an absolute disaster for Scottish broadcasting? First Minister. Well, firstly, yes, I do share these concerns. I am very disappointed and concerned that STV is cutting jobs and closing its second channel only a year after that channel was launched. This will be a very worrying time for all employees of STV uh, who are affected by yesterday's announcement and my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of the Chamber are with them. You know, this is a time when it is more important than ever that the Scottish perspective on local, national and international news is reflected by our broadcasters. It is therefore crucial that the STV news service is not diminished and that its team of excellent journalists can continue to produce a high quality news service covering the whole of Scotland. And I hope that STV uh, will listen uh, to the concerns that are being expressed right now. Uh, finally, in terms of uh, the part of Joe McAlpine's question relating to speculation about this being preparation for a sale to ITV, certainly, uh, I had uh, someone express that concern to me uh, yesterday. I have no knowledge that would suggest that is the case, uh, but that is not a move I would wish to see, and I think that move would be uh, opposed and resisted by very many people across the country. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, an opportunity for LGBT people and allies around the world to rally against all forms of discrimination based on sexuality or gender identity. 90% of LGBT people in Scotland have faced bullying in schools, and I'm troubled by the impact this has on young people in my region. So Scottish Labour welcomes the government's commitment to work with the Thai campaign. Does the First Minister believe that statutory LGBTI inclusive education in Scotland will become a reality during this Parliament? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, let me recognise uh, that today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia and express my support for that. Uh, I'm proud to say that the rainbow flag is flying today outside Scottish Government buildings uh, to mark this occasion. Uh, there is absolutely no place in Scotland for prejudice or discrimination. Everybody deserves to be treated fairly. Uh, Scotland is recognised, and we should all be proud of this, as one of the most progressive countries in Europe in terms of LGBTI rights. However, we know that there is a need to do more to tackle all forms of prejudice. We know that uh, that is particularly true when it comes uh, to homophobic bullying in our schools. Uh, that is why we are working with the Thai campaign uh, to take forward their pledges uh, through the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group, which was set up by the Deputy First Minister to promote an inclusive approach to sex and relationships education. Education and we will continue to work with them to take forward uh, their pledges and any recommendations uh, over the course of this Parliament. Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What engagement has the Scottish Government undertaken with the UK Government since Tuesday when this Parliament, Tories accepted, 
united to refuse consent to the EU withdrawal bill? First Minister. Well, we continue to ask the UK Government to listen to and, more importantly, respect uh, the view of this Parliament, which was so decisively expressed in the vote on Tuesday. Uh, the requirement uh, in the Convention uh, to respect the views of, of this Parliament and not to proceed with legislation uh, that affects the powers of this Parliament without our consent is not a nicety, it is not an add-on, it is a fundamentally important part of our constitutional settlement. Those are actually the words of Adam Tompkins just a, a matter of weeks ago. So I would hope that the Tories uh, would stand up for the rights of this parliament uh, and demand, like we do, that the UK government listens. There is still time to get an agreement on this, but an agreement can only be reached if it respects the rights of this parliament and is based on the fundamentally important principle of the consent genuine consent of this parliament. And George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. At this morning's Social Security Committee, we heard evidence from a range of stakeholders. They told us the rollout of universal credit will put the Scottish Welfare Fund under pressure, that families with disabled children have been evicted because of Tory benefit caps, and carers are losing out because of universal credit. Will the First Minister renew calls for a halt to universal credit and urge the UK Government to think again? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will renew that call. Uh, the fact of the matter is universal credit, as well as the other welfare cuts being imposed by uh, this Conservative government, are causing misery for people, not just in Scotland, but right across the UK. And the Tories appear to be oblivious to the impact uh, of the decisions that they are taking. So I hope that we will see a halt to universal credit, uh, at least until the problems associated with it are properly sorted out, because vulnerable people, the length and breadth of the country, should not be paying the price uh, for the ideology of the Conservative Party. And question number five, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest in that I'm a registered mental health nurse who holds an honorary contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Mental Health Awareness Week. First Minister. Well, we very much welcome Mental Health Awareness Week. Good mental health is as important as good physical health, and we want to create a Scotland uh, free from stigma around mental health. The theme of this year's week is stress. We can all take small steps to help ourselves uh, cope uh, better. One of mine is uh, making the time to read books, as I've said on uh, many occasions, but different people will find different ways. It's important, though, that people pay attention uh, to their mental health. Uh, I also took the opportunity uh, when I was in Dumfries yesterday for the National Economic Forum to visit the Crichton campus to talk to students about their own experiences of mental well-being. The Minister for Mental Health launched CME's forthcoming campaign on young people's mental health on Tuesday uh, and through this we are seeking to explore directly with young people what mental health means to them as part of the Year of uh, Young People 2018. Claire Hockey. I thank the First Minister for that answer. In many instances, those who complete suicide have accessed websites which actively promote, encourage and give information on methods of self-harm. It has been reported that internet providers are not removing these sites when advised of their existence. This results in suicide prevention organisations having to pay for expensive adverts to appear in search results to signpost those in need to appropriate support. Can the First Minister join me and my colleague Gillian Martin in the campaign for search engines and social media to take more responsibility in preventing access to this dangerous content? First Minister. Well, this is... This is a very, very serious issue, and I would commend uh, Claire Hockey and Gillian Martin for raising awareness of this issue. Search engine providers and social media should always take responsibility for preventing access to any form of dangerous content, uh, which obviously includes material which advocates suicide methods. Our draft suicide prevention action plan, in which we recently ran a public engagement process, included a proposed action to work with partners to develop a strong online suicide prevention presence. And this type of initiative would be likely to consider the question of access to dangerous content and signposting to appropriate sources of support. So this uh, will certainly be an issue that uh, the suicide prevention action plan looks at. And I hope uh, members across the chamber will continue to support efforts in this uh, regard. Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, it is a glaring gap in mental health services that there is not a mental health crisis centre in Dundee offering out-of-hours support. 
I visited the Edinburgh Crisis Centre a couple of weeks ago and found an excellent facility where people can get the care and support they need at any time of the day or night by self-referral. On 18th of January, I asked the First Minister if she agreed with me that one of these centres was needed in Dundee. She said she broadly agreed. What progress has she made since then on delivering a mental health crisis centre in Dundee? First Minister. Well, I'll ask the Health Secretary to reply to Jenny Mara in more detail. As uh, the member is aware, NHS Tayside is currently right now looking at a range of issues around their mental health uh, services. I, I would hope that this is something that they will give uh, further consideration uh, to, but I will uh, ask the Health Secretary to write to Jenny Mara with an update uh, on discussions on that issue. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too welcome Mental Health Awareness Week. A recent Sam H survey really revealed that two thirds of teachers don't feel they have received sufficient training in mental health to carry out their role properly? Will the First Minister back calls from the Scottish Conservatives to roll out a national programme of mental health teacher training and improve counselling services for secondary pupils? First Minister. Um, I think training is important and we will continue uh, to work with local authorities to ensure that teachers have access to the resources and the training that they need. I uh, talked in response to an earlier question about some of the other work that's been done in our schools. But generally speaking, uh, what we want to do is to try to get more services in place uh, in a more preventative uh, manner. And that means having uh, access to people uh, who can help where there are issues around mental health in schools and in other non-NHS settings. So this is part of that uh, and I think making sure that teachers and others who may be interacting uh, with young people with mental health issues have the proper backing and training to do that is important. And Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Mental Health Awareness Week reminds us that um, personal struggles can end in tragedy. All too often, suicides occur in so-called clusters, leaving families, friends and communities devastated, especially when it involves young people. What support can the Scottish Government give to communities facing the tragedy of suicide? First Minister. Well, firstly, I don't think any of us who haven't experienced suicide directly through a member of our family or a close friend can properly understand the trauma, the long lasting trauma uh, that will be experienced. So it's important that uh, as well as doing everything we can to prevent suicide, uh, we also provide support to families or communities uh, who have been affected by the tragedy of suicide. Uh, we've set out three areas uh, to Parliament already that will be included in the new Suicide Prevention Action Plan. Uh, one of those is delivery of uh, more constant crisis support for people who've lost a loved one uh, to suicide. Um, and the action plan uh, will no doubt uh, cover more ways in which uh, greater support should be given to families and communities. But this is an important aspect uh, of this whole issue uh, and one that we are determined through the new action plan to address. Thank you. Move on to question number six, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. To uh, ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on extending the right to vote to all prisoners. First Minister. Uh, I've noted the Equalities and Human Rights Committee report that was published earlier this week. Uh, I've previously been clear that now that this power is devolved, the Scottish Parliament will need to consider how to ensure compliance with the European Court of Human Rights ruling. Uh, but I have to say I am not of the view that this should lead to the enfranchising of all prisoners and I am to say the least sceptical that complying with the ECHR requires all prisoners to have the right to vote. Uh, as the committee makes clear further consultation with a wide uh, range of stakeholders including victims of crime and the general public is needed and the Scottish Government will respond to the committee's report in due course. Murdo Fraser. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for her response and indeed welcome it as she referred to uh, earlier this week Labour, Lib Dem and SNP MSPs on this Parliament's Equalities and Human Rights Committee supported calls to give all prisoners the right to vote. Now in response to that the victims campaigner John Muir whose son Damien was stabbed to death in 2007 said this it is an obscenity that this is even being considered and an insult to all victims of crime. My son's civil liberties died with him on the street. Why would someone who has committed murder or carried out a brutal rape be afforded the privilege of being able to vote? Does the First Minister agree that all MSPs should be listening to victims of crime like Mr Muir 
and standing up for their rights first. First Minister. Well, I, I would say to, to Murdo Fraser that I am sure that all MSPs uh, will be very mindful of the views of, of victims of crime. Uh, the comments I made uh, a moment ago, I think, are, are very clear. I, I'm not making any criticism of the committee. The committee uh, looked at this issue and has made recommendations as they are entitled to do. Uh, these are, are difficult and sensitive issues. Uh, we now have a power devolved to us that was previously reserved. Uh, therefore, we have an obligation to make sure that our laws in this country are compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but it is my view that we should uh, not give the vote to all prisoners. Uh, I don't don't, uh, I'm certainly not persuaded uh, of enfranchising uh, prisoners who are in prison uh, for the most uh, serious and heinous crimes uh, and are perhaps in prison for uh, lengthy periods of time. Um, and I don't think that is required to comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. Beyond that, I think there is a debate, a proper mature, grown-up debate that this Parliament requires to have. And I would thank the committee uh, for their report, for informing that debate. The fact that I don't agree with all of the recommendations uh, doesn't mean that that's not a debate that we, we need to have. So I hope all members, as we have this debate, uh, as I said earlier on, the government in due course will respond uh, formally to the committee's report. But I hope as this debate progresses within Parliament, all of us listen to the victims of crime. We've always got a duty to do that on all of these issues. And I hope Parliament together can come to a sensible outcome uh, to this debate in due course. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware that the right to vote is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And many agree with the Prison Reform Trust that voting is not a privilege, rather it's a basic human right. First Minister, when Tom Halpin, the highly respected head of SACRO, evidences the benefits of enfranchising prisoners. Will you please take the opportunity, oh, beg your pardon, will you please take the opportunity to ensure that Scotland joins progressive countries such as Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Finland on this important issue? First Minister. Well, I think there are a range of arrangements in place across other countries. I uh, believe there are a, a range of interpretations around ECHR uh, rulings. Um, I, I think, as Murdo Fraser was right to say, we've got to listen to the victims of crime. I think it's also important to listen to those who work uh, with uh, people who are sentenced uh, to prison. I, I'm a huge believer, uh, and I think this is seen in many aspects of the Scottish Government's justice policies. I'm a huge believer in the importance of rehabilitation, of uh, doing everything everything we can through our justice system to rehabilitate prisoners but all, and also reduce re-offending in the process. So this is a complex issue and I, you know, I'm perhaps being naive here in making this plea at the outset of what undoubtedly will be a sensitive debate for this parliament that none of us come at it from absolutely fixed positions but in a mature grown-up way uh, we look at all of the issues very carefully and come to uh, a balanced outcome. I'm being very clear that I don't uh, support enfranchising all prisoners uh, but I do think there is a debate and a decision here that the parliament requires uh, to take so we've got the opportunity to try to do that uh, and get to the right outcome for the best reasons and I hope all of us regardless of party take that opportunity. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on now to members' business in the name of Clare Hockey on the Everyone's Business campaign. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats and for the gallery to clear.